Hello everyone in Facebook land. Uh, let me make sure you guys have audio, which is always nice. That way at least I know I'm not talking to myself since, you know, I'm not quite that mad yet. All right, I'm going to go ahead and cue the other cameras and then we are going to get directly into the Fukushima update. How about that? Second. And now I'm just waiting for Google. Greetings, unsettled souls. The Sam I began you during political commentary for the media speaks. You might know me from blasting news. You, you might know me from Wits News. You might know me enough to wonder where I've been. Uh, hello, Deidre. Hello, David. Um, I have decided that I'm only going to be doing two shows per month. I know I was doing like eight for a while. And I'm going to address real quickly why that is. Um, it is possible. And I... I address this on my Facebook page. It's possible to take so many ingredients out of a recipe that the food, while it is still good, is not delicious. So I'm going to tell a real quick story, then I'm going to get into the Fukushima update here. Uh, stay with me, because it explains a lot. Um, my father was an amazing cook. Amazing. Absolutely astounding. And he made, I would argue, some of the best Italian uh, Italian spaghetti, whatever sauce you want to call it, marinara, you've ever had. Delicious. He used a bit of sugar. Not a lot, but he used some sugar. And when he, when he became a diabetic, he had to alter his recipe. He used variations of this. And it changed it to the point where his amazing food wasn't as amazing anymore. And some of the people who began this show with me, that, that uh, it was my idea, I curated it, but the people that breathed air into it have, for reasons that still I do not understand, have done whatever, and it, it's drastically changed. The entire recipe has changed, and I just don't feel like eight shows a month now is the same. I am, however, staying with Fukushima, and I'm staying with the Dump Cap of the Month Award. The reason for that is, uh, first of all, the Dump Cap of the Month Award is something that's created entirely by yours truly, the, the whole thing. So I don't want to lose that. Second of all, I need it for purposes of getting press passes or whatever and uh, freelance writing jobs. And the reason I'm staying with Fukushima is because even if you've gone through something like I just talked about, maybe maybe your birthdays are horrible, your holidays are horrible, yada yada, you know. What makes that worse? Now stay with me, stay with me. What makes that worse? If you're incredibly depressed, maybe. What makes that worse? How about a good case of cancer? How about having to deal with going to the hospital all the time? I mean, you want to know something? That's what Fukushima is doing. TEPCO and the nuclear industry. No matter how whether you're depressed, maybe you're, maybe you're thrilled. Maybe you have a great life. Maybe you've got a husband or a wife that genuinely loves you. Hug them, by the way. Maybe you really, how would you feel if tomorrow they had cancer? You'd be really depressed. What if they died? You'd be really depressed. You'd be devastated. What would make that even worse? You wouldn't be afraid to die. That You might welcome that. You would, what would be horrible? How about your bones giving out that nobody can tell why? How about getting some horrible infectious disease and not knowing what it is while you're dealing with the fact that, you know, your husband just died or whatever. These are the kinds of things that Fukushima has done. So I'm only doing, I'm only keeping two shows alive on the correct views for the foreseeable future. And it will be the Dump Cap of the Month Award and the massive Fukushima update, which begins now. If you'd like to donate, please do so at the correct views at hotmail.com. You can do so through PayPal. Um, friends, we're going to go in depth. And if we're going to do a show, let's do a real show. How about that? Um, 
This is from Dr. Helen Caldicott. For those of you who don't know who she is, she's uh, very likely the, the well, the, all right, Chris Busby and Helen Caldicott would be a tie. I was going to say the, the best minds on the topic here, but between the two of them, Helen Caldicott, by the way, for those of you that don't like Mr. Trump, as I do, um, by the way, Trump is wrong on nuclear issues. Um, but for those of you that are on the left side of the aisle, so is she. She's a raging leftist to, to the point where she says sometimes utterly ridiculous things, such as missiles are built the way they are because they look like penises. Yeah, because we all know the flying vagina bomb would definitely kill far more people. So she says things that are really, really dumb. Okay, a dunce cap of the month kind of statements because she's a leftist and that's what they do. However, when it comes to Fukushima, she's a doctor. Okay? We are talking about someone who understands in great detail and who can convey the, uh, the, the true problems with this. And before I want to start, before I go into this, I want to say just one more thing concerning it. Um, there are a lot of people that tend to hit my comment line who say things such as, can you prove that where these cancers are coming from? Can you, you know, can you prove that Fukushima is causing these things? And there have been times that I have mentioned that the, the or what do they call it, the decomposing of nuclear elements. They can tell which radionuclei have been released from where based on how long it takes them to decay. So they can tell whether or not they have come from Fukushima or come from you know bomb testing of the 50s or something. Um, there are other ways to tell. And I was very happy to find this article where uh, Dr. Caldercott addresses it. So I'm going to I'm going to give you most of the article here, friends. It is a bit long. It's extremely informative, and I, this would just, I guess would be a video that I really suggest sharing for people. And if you I mean if you're going to hit share, absolutely do so now because this is this is really interesting. Let me try to go to screen share for those of you that are on. Uh, don't let me do it because it's Google and Google sucks. All right, um, check this out. It goes on to say who she is. I just said who she was. It's on Global Research. If you want to read it for yourself, type in Dr. Helen Caldicott and uh, Fukushima, and you'll find it. All right, they ask. Uh, Global Research asks her. Now, the Japanese government is preparing to welcome visitors to Japan for the 2020 Olympics. A coverage on the 8th anniversary of Fukushima disaster is hardly, it seems to me, registered given the significant radiological and other dangers that you, Dr. Caldicott, cited and your authors cited in your 2014 book, Crisis Without End. Now it's been more than four years since that book came out. I was hoping that you could update our listenership on what is currently being recognized as the main health threats in 2019, perhaps not registered in the book, that you're currently looking at in relation to the Fukushima meltdown. Uh, Caldercott replied, well, it's difficult because, well, she would have said it in an English accent, you see. Well, it's difficult because the Japanese gov government would have authorized really only examination of thyroid cancer. Now, joking aside, listen to this. All of you that ask how disease can be proved to come from Fukushima, Listen, because I'm addressing it now, so you people can quit haunting my comment line with your stupidity. Now, thyroid cancer is caused by radioactive iodine, and there were many, many cases of that after Chernobyl, of course, the Russian disaster from the 80s, which was similar, but not quite as bad as Fukushima. Already, they've looked at children under the age of 18, and in Fukushima Prefecture at the time of the accident, and how many of them? A hundred? No, 201 by June of 18 last year, 201 had developed thyroid cancer. Now, I have had some people say, well, yes, but that's because they're testing. No. The testing is to prove whether or not you are in danger of thyroid cancer. Now, you want to know how rare this really is? Listen, 
is from a doctor, by the way, so don't tell me I made it up. Some cancers had metastasized, that means spread. The incidence of thyroid cancer in that population normally is one per million. So obviously, obviously there's an epidemic of thyroid cancer, and it's just starting now. Now remember, it's one per million, but we're seeing a lot of these uh, thyroid issues happening in children. It is much less than one per million when you're talking about children. Unless, of course, they've been exposed to radiation. Oh, but it wasn't high enough to cause it. Well, it obviously was in 201 cases which makes it far higher per capita than one per million. So she has proven her point at the very beginning. And she goes on to give even more. What people need to understand, she says, is the latent period of carcinogenesis, they did that weird, i.e. the time after exposure to radiation when cancers develop, is any time from 3 to 80 years. That means that's how long it takes for you to get the cancer after you've been around the radiation, which is inevitably going to cause it. And so it's a very, very long period. Thyroid cancers appear early. Leukemia appears five to ten years later. Pause. But that sink in. Thyroid cancer rates are going to That is step number one. If you're Forrest Gump and you're going to run across the country. What? We've taken step one. Thyroid cancer. Sound fun? If you want to know why this is one of the only two shows I'm keeping, you're getting a chance to see it right now. Are you getting some idea as to what she's saying here? We've, stayed, we've taken step one. How do you like cancer rates going through the roof for everybody, including children? Let's see where the rest of the journey should take us, shall we? They're not looking for leukemia. Solid cancers of every organ, or any organ as such, appear about 15 years later and continue. And in fact, the Hibakusha from the Hiroshima and Nagasaki are still alive. And there are still developing cancers. Those who are still alive, I'm sorry, are still developing cancers in higher than normal rates. Yes, that means even for their age bracket. Yes, that means even for somebody as old as they are to have been alive during the World War II bombings. Cancer incidences in that age group are still high. The Japanese government, she said, has told uh, doctors uh, they are not to talk to the parents about radiation and illnesses derived thereof. And in fact, the doctors do do that. They might lose, if they do, they may lose their funding from the government. The IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, interestingly set up a hospital, a cancer hospital in Fukushima, along with the Fukushima University for people with cancer, which tells you everything. They've got their own cancer unit right there. They build it right in because they know what's coming. She says, so there's a huge, huge cover-up, and I have been to Japan twice, and particularly to Fukushima, and spoken to people there, and the parents are desperate to hear the truth, even if it's not the good truth. And they thanked me for telling them. So it's an absolute medical catastrophe, I would say. This is a doctor. And a total cover-up to protect the nuclear industry from the ramifications. And all of its ramifications. Uh, they ask, now are you going to talk, are, you go are we talking about some of the contamination that happened eight years ago? Or are we talking about the emissions from, for example, and uh, the doctor cut her off. We, well, there are going to be emissions well into the air consistency, number one. Number two, a huge amount of water is being stored, over a million gallons in tanks at the site. The water is going, is being siphoned off from the reactor cores, the melted, damaged cores. The water is pumped consistently every day, every hour, to keep the cores cool in case they have another melt. And that water, of course, is extremely contaminated. And if they don't do that, it'll, it'll explode. Now they, now they say they have filtered out the contaminants except for the tritium, which is part of the water molecule, but they haven't. Now, listen to this, because I didn't know this. I actually thought they had, at least on the water that had gone through the system, not the rest of it, of course. It's leaking or it's overflowing. The 
just that has been sent through the system, I had thought that they had gotten everything out for Tritium. I would like to publicly say I, I was wrong here. I was going by data that seems to have been not as bad as the actual truth is. People like to say that I, 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 I'm an alarmist of some kind. I even wrote a song about that once when I cared about music. But it's different now. Not only was I not an alarmist, I wasn't an alarmist enough. Okay, listen. There is strontium. What is strontium? Come on, regular listeners. That's bone cancer. Yes. Cesium and many other elements in the water. It's highly radioactive. And because there isn't enough room to build more tanks, they're talking about emptying all of that water into the Pacific Ocean. And the fishermen are very, very upset. The fish already being caught off Fukushima are some are obviously contaminated, but this will be a disaster. Water comes down from the mountains behind the reactors, she said, and flows underneath the reactors and into the sea, and always has. And when the reactors were in good shape, the water was fine. It didn't get contaminated because of the, the, the structure of the power plant unit itself. But now, she says, the three molten coal cores intact with that water flowing under the cores and so seeing the water flowing into the Pacific is very radioactive, and it's a separate thing from the million gallons or those in the tanks. They put up a refrigerated wall of frozen dirt around the reactors to prevent that water from the mountains flowing underneath the reactors, which has cut down the amount of water flowing per day from 500 tons to about 150. But of course, if they lose electricity, that refrigeration system is going to fail, and it's a transient thing anyway, so it's ridiculous in terms. So over time, the Pacific is going to become more and more radioactive. Uh, she's right there, although, again, I think, uh, like many people who are on the far left, they do miss a bit of nuances. There are people there who did not cause this, who are trying to fix it, and by bringing it down from 500 tons of water to 150 tons greatly does slow the radioactive poisoning that she's talking about. Now, granted, we're talking about 40 years here, so Miss Caldercott and I are on the same page when it comes to this. But I think she does need to give some applause and approval to those who had greatly slowed the amount of contamination going into the ocean because of what she has done. Um, they talk about decommissioning and removing molten cores, she says. When robots go in and try and have to look at them, their wiring just melts and disappears. This is true. We've talked about this ad nauseum. They're extraordinarily radioactive. No human can go near them because they would die within 48 hours from the radiation exposure. They will never, and I quote, never decommission those reactors. Now, let's pause there. That's even been boldened here in the article. That is very alarming. Ooh, I just said it would take about 30 or 40 years to decommission the power plants to make them even closely something that would be considered safe to be around, such as they have done in Chernobyl. She says this will never happen. And that could be the case. To be the case because the for one thing the geological structure of japan is vastly different from russia so the whole dome thing is an option due to the porous nature of the island and its uh, proximity to future earthquakes and tsunamis which is of course how japan was made they will never be able to stop the water coming down from the mountains and so the truth be known it's an ongoing global radiological catastrophe which no one is addressing in full uh, they ask, do we have a better reading, for example, on thyroids, also leukemia incubation? No, they're not looking. Well, leukemia, they're not looking for leukemia, just thyroid, they ask. She says they're not charting it, so the only cancer they're looking at is thyroid cancer, and that's really high, and you know it's at 201 have already been diagnosed, and some have metastasized. And the very tight lid is being kept on any other sort of radiation-related illness and leukemia and the like. All of the other cancers and the like in leukemia is so it's just a catastrophe. And it's a, they ask, cover up? She answers, yeah, I would really explain how 
I feel medically about it, did I? It's just hideous. Um, Global Research asks, uh, well, I have a brother who's a physician who was pointing to, well, we should maybe the World Health Organization is a fairly authoritative body of research for all of the indicators and epidemiological aspects of this. But you seem to suggest that the World Health Organization may not be that reliable in light of the fact that they are partnered with the IAEA. Is that my understanding? She says immediately, correct. They signed a document, I think, in 1959 with the IAEA, and they should not report it, that they should not report any medical effects of radiological disasters. And they've stuck to that. So they are now, in effect, in this area, part of the IAEA, whose mission is to promote nuclear power. So don't even think about the World Health Organization. It's obscene. Now, she might be surprised to find out that though she is on the far left, I know it doesn't look like I'm pointing left, some of the three cameras I'm using point the other way, but it is left. Um, for some of them on the left, we agree. I think the World Health Organization is a sham on a number of instances. And for those of you on the left who like to somehow embrace this, go ahead and let what she said sink in. In 1959, they signed a deal with the World Health Organization to not address nuclear issues. But now the, nuclear, the World Health Organization is out there telling us how safe Fukushima is. Aren't you glad you hit that subscribe button? I don't know, I really don't know, but they sold themselves to the devil, she said, of the World Health Organization. A general review said that they found it pretty incredible. There's also the issue of biomagnifications in the ocean, where you have radioactive debris, hundreds of tons of this radioactive water going into the ocean, and biomagnifying up through the food chain. What's that mean? She explains it. So these radioactive particles can get inside of our bodies, basically... Little fish eat big fish, and sooner or later, we eat one of the fish. Rain it hits the ground, ground absorbs it into the sky, jet stream moves it over to an entirely different part of the world, rains it down, radioactive nuclei get into our system. Radioactive elements catch fire, move the radioactive elements entirely to a different section of Japan due to the wind, the jet stream brings that radioactive. You follow, and there's a million ways this can happen. So I've just given you three. Can you speak to what you anticipate to see, what you would anticipate, whether it's recorded by the World Health Authorities or not? What should we expect to see in the years ahead in terms of the illnesses that may manifest themselves? She said, well, number one, Fukushima is a very agricultural prefecture. Beautiful, beautiful peaches, beautiful food, and lots of rice. Now, keep in mind, beautiful is important because you look at it and it looks like, you know, look at that peach. You can't see the fact that it is as toxic as it can possibly be. The, the beauty of the area. Oh, we need to protect the pristine beauty. So let's all continue to live here in a radioactive hell. She says, and the radiation spread far and wide through the Fukushima prefecture. And indeed, they have been plowing up millions and millions and tons of radioactive dirt and storing it in plastic bags all over the prefecture. The mountains are highly radioactive, and every time that it rains, the rain down comes radiation with the water, and radiation, the elements. And there are over 200 radioactive elements made in a nuclear reactor. Oh, but let's pause. We hear about, what, 20 of them? Maybe 10, the big ones, of course, cesium, iodine, strontium, um, uranium, plutonium, tritium. Okay, there are over 200, all of them. Bad for cancer, bad for bones, bad for catching every cold in the world bad for problems with the eyes, bad for problems with the blood, over 200. Some have lives of seconds, and some have lives of millions of years, or lasts for millions of years, will I say. So there are many, many isotopes, long-lasting isotopes, cesium, strontium, tritium is another one, but many, many on the soil in Fukushima. 
And what happens, you talked about biomagnification, she says. When the plants take up the water from the soil, they take up the cesium, which is a potassium analog. It resembles potassium. Now, potassium is in bananas. So when you eat the potassium, your body can't tell that it's not um, cesium. So it brings the cesium into your body, thinking it's potassium. And the potassium, of course, keeps you healthy. The, the radioactive element that mimics potassium then lives in your body to kill you. That's what she's talking about here. She goes on. Strontium-90 resembles calcium and the like. That's why strontium-90 goes and gets bone cancer, because the body cannot tell strontium from um, calcium. Are you starting to see the problem here? Are you starting to see why I warn you against drinking too much milk? eating too much cheese. Cheese and milk are a hard one for me, by the way. Um, every once in a while I get a craving and I imbibe, but I try to avoid it. Um, these ingredients get magnified by orders of magnitude in the rice and in the plants. And so when you eat food that is grown in Fukushima, the chances are it's going to be relatively radioactive. They've been diluting radioactive rice with non-radioactive rice to make it seem better. Now you know why the tests of Fukushima rice aren't as bad as you expected. She says, now into the ocean go these isotopes as well, and the algae biomagnify them by, you know, 10 to 100 times or more. And then the crustaceans eat the algae. And that biomagnifies it more. In other words, highlights it in terms of radioactive toxicity as it relates to your ingestion. That's a good way to define it. Yeah. Okay, less than bad way to define it. Can we agree? The little fish eat, she said little fish like I did. The little fish eat the crustaceans. The big fish eat the little fish and the like. And tuna found in off the coast of California some years ago contained isotopes of Fukushima. Now, we've covered that a lot. Also, fish being caught on the lower west coast of California contain some of these isotopes. So it's an ongoing mag biomagnification catastrophe. And the thing is that you can't even taste, smell, or see radioactive elements when they're in your food. They're invisible, and it takes a long time for cancers to occur. And you can't identify a particular cancer caused by a particular substance or isotope. You can only identify the problem by doing epidemiological studies comparing irradiated people with non-irradiated people to see what the cancer levels are. And that data comes from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and many other studies. Chernobyl as well, no? She says, oh, Chernobyl, well, a wonderful book was produced by the Russians and produced by the New York Academy of Sciences called Chernobyl with over 5,000 on-the-ground studies of children and diseases in Belarus and the Ukraine and all over Europe. And by now, over a million people have already died from the Chernobyl disaster. Do you notice how the official numbers have been kept way under that? But when a doctor who knows what she's talking about studies it, the, the true numbers tend to come to light. Did you hear that? A million people. We, we've been at war, in theory at least. We've been at war over 3,000 people dying at the World Trade Center. Why are we not, at least at an economic war, with an industry the nuclear industry has killed over a million people. I mean, argue it's Russia. Why aren't the Russians that angry? Many diseases have been caused by that, she says, and including premature aging in children, microlophily in babies, very small heads, diabetes, leukemia. I mean, I could go on and on. I mean, those diseases which have been very well described in that wonderful book which everyone should read, they are not being addressed or identified or looked for in the Fukushima or Japan population, Japanese population. They're not even looking for the problems that were in Chernobyl. They're not even testing for them. Doesn't that tell you what they're trying to hide, what they're trying to cover up? 
May I say the parts of Tokyo are extremely radioactive. Uh, people have been measuring the dirt from roofs and apartments and the roadways from vacuum cleaner dust. You did. Who? Our Dr. Ernie Gunderson, for one. And so I'm my, he may not be, I think he's a doctor. And some of these samples, they're so radioactive that they would classify to be buried in radioactive waste facilities in America. So that's number one. That's just the ground. Just the regular dirt, the air filters in your average apartment or furnace in Fukushima would register as radioactive toxins. If you tried to get on a plane with it, you'd probably go to prison. Number two, to have the Olympics in Fukushima just defies imagination. Some of those areas where the athletes are going to be running, the dust and dirt there has been measured and it's highly radioactive. So this is Abe, the Prime Minister of Japan, who set this up to as sort of a way to obscure what Fukushima really means. And those young athletes, you know, the, the young people are much more sensitive to radiation, developing cancers later than the older people. It's just a catastrophe waiting to happen. They're calling it the Radioactive Olympics. Uh, is there anything that people can do, you know, whether they live in Japan or, say, the west coast of North America, to mitigate the effects that the disaster has had and may still be having eight years later? Now, this is important because it addresses people living on the west coast. And I, with tons of science, provable science behind me, have long said, even the person who used to care about me in this show has long said, you cannot live in Alaska, Hawaii, Oregon, California, or Washington, and be safe. You can't live on that coast and be safe. It is impossible. You will develop problems. And there were people who have looked at me like I'm an alien for having said this. And then they find out before very long that I'm not. For instance, I, I have a friend, and I don't want to name her here because she's somebody who adamantly doesn't listen to me on this. And I said that one of the first symptoms that you could expect to see are an increase in severity of migraines, which is something that they are experiencing now, or largely, I suspect, because they are living on the West Coast. Guaranteed to diminish you, not only the length of your life, but the quality of your life. You deny it all you want to, but unfortunately, it's true. Anything they can do to mitigate the effects of the disaster. Um, yes, do not eat any Japanese food because you don't know where it's sourced. Do not eat fish from Japan, miso, rice, you name it. Do not eat Japanese food, period. Um, fish caught off the west coast of Canada and America, well, they're not testing the fish, so I don't know what you do. Um, I mean... Most of it's probably not radioactive, but you don't know because you can't taste it, which is why I have accurately said I, uh, Sam so doesn't know what he's talking about. He's local in DSA, right? All right, fine. I have a doctor agreeing with me, a doctor who is on the opposite side of the political spectrum than me. Do you now believe me? Do you now know why the show is called Accurately the Correct Views? They closed down the airborne radioactive measuring instruments off the west coast of America, and that's pretty bad because there could still be another huge accident at these reactors. For instance, if there's another earthquake, number one, all of those tanks would be destroyed and the water would be poured into the Pacific Ocean. Number two, there could be another meltdown. They release a huge release of radiation from the damaged reactors. So things are very, very tenuous, and they're not just tenuous now, they're tenuous forever. Now, this is interesting to note because I condemned openly, and with good reason, I would say, the Obama administration for shutting down the, the machines, the, the, the testing devices for radioactive poison in America. And that was done for the good of the bottom line. It was done for the good of General Electric and their big lobbyists. Unfortunately, and I'm a big supporter of Mr. Trump, but he's wrong on all things nuclear. Um, he hasn't turned these testing units back on. And I think it's important for us to unify and to let him know that we know on certain terms he needs to, to have this done. And that our food needs to be tested for radioactive poison, whether or not it's popular or not. These things need to happen. 
plain and simple. All right, moving on, friends. Um, Newsminer.com. I think this might be their first time on the show, so welcome aboard. Fukushima radiation found in Fukushima related radiation found in Bering Sea samples. Now, don't you love how I tie the show together for you all night? So, um, I had told you openly that this was going to be the case with finding rains in one area and the jet stream takes the radioactive toxin to another. Right. It's from Fairbanks. Researchers on the lookout for water contamination found St. Lawrence Island to have discovered elevated radiation levels in the waters of the Bering Sea, which has raised concerns for the subsistence of community b -b 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 live live broadcast here i knew that those japanese currents would come to our waters and so that's why i volunteered to do the testing said eddie Ungat, a resident of gamble said at the university of alaska fairbanks news release on wednesday Ungat was president of the tribunal government of the native village of gamble when he began testing the water off the shore of St. Lawrence Island, he is still a resident today. On August of 2018, sample found from the Bering Sea showed increased levels of cesium-137. Hey, didn't we just talk about how cesium mimics important elements in the body and then hides to give you cancer? Cesium-137 is somewhat present in the ocean from open-air testing of nuclear weapons in the 1960s and 70s normally around two becquerels per cubic meter. The August 2018 sample shows levels of 2.4 becquerels per cubic meter. A becquerel is a unit of measure of radioactivity. You can think of it as one nuclear explosion per second on a micro level. It's a radioactive substance, Alaska Sea Grant agent Gay Sheffield said. It's a byproduct of nuclear fission and it is among the radioactive isotopes released when the Fukushima nuclear reactor was damaged. This month marks the eighth year since the one again, it was when this was written last month, we covered that. I'd really say that this was a very collaborative effort, he said. Uh, well, so we have a lot of people from a lot of different areas finding the same problems in the same area. And they were looking for cesium-134 and cesium-137. But cesium-134 has a smaller half-life. So again, they're able with a pretty decent amount of accuracy to be able to tell where much of this has come from. Uh, moving on, friends, the bigwobble.org. It might be their first time on the show, too. Eight years on water of water woes threaten Fukushima cleanup with fish found around the waters of Hawaii and Alaska contaminated with cesium-134. See how I tied this all together for you? You thought you were paying attention for nothing, didn't you? Is anyone still listening? Put in the comment line, I'm still listening, and I'll make sure you get something cool. The radioactive fingerprint of Fukushima is, of course, a radioactive isotope cesium-134. The science surrounding the Fuku disaster recently has been deafening. It is one year, in fact, since any reliable information has been released from TEPCO, that is GE, who you never ever get in and never invest in, never support their stocks, never join mutual funds for. Last year, TEPCO, GE, said a system meant to purify contaminated water had failed to remove radioactive contaminants. That's what Dr. Helen Caldicott had just corrected me on. A report from Reuters today claims that most of the water stored in 1,000 banks around the plant will need to be reprocessed before it is released into the ocean. So, again, there's more proof of what she's talking about. They're trying to release it into the ocean. Reprocessing could take nearly two years and divert personnel and energy from dismantling the tsunami-wrecked reactors, a project that will take up to 40 years. Dr. Caldicott said never. It is unclear how much they would decay decommissioning, how much it would delay decommissioning, but any delay could be pricey, which, of course, it's all they're concerned about is their bottom line. As a musha in Alaska, I have often been blessed from collecting numerous people's previous year's salmon catch 
as they cleaned out the freezers, making room for the current year's catch. I fed it to my dog team and ate endless pounds of it myself. I've also enjoyed standing on the banks of some of the first class rivers while fishing for salmon with a pole, which I no longer do. When the Fukushima fiasco occurred, it was obvious to me that the currents that came from Alaska, from Japan, we were in trouble. I believed our fishing resources would become radioactive, and because I love my dogs, I would most love their family members. I looked at them, I knew I had to verify that their food supply was safe. So what did we find? While talking to everyone I could, who was supposedly in the know, I was assured that there would be no problem. Oh, well, let's just, you know, roll over, right? That did not ease my mind. I decided to invest in a radiation monitor of my own. Being a disabled veteran with limited income, I set out to buy a meter of the best value I could find, and he found uh, he uses the Radex RD-1503. Uh, he goes on about learning how to use it. Uh, he's found an increase of over 27% of radiation levels since 2012. So whether the data I have observed is minimal or should be alarming, it's building up every year. Reports like this, are they've streamed in almost nonstop. Okay, we've got two stories left, so stay with me, because I think all of this is, it needs to be shared. That's why I'm hoping you're hitting the share. I'm hoping you're listening 41 minutes and 13 seconds into this, because it matters. News Center 1, nuclear, re, uh, nu this is again, in mainstream news, a nuclear power plant in Nebraska could be turned off due to flooding. NWS Omaha, in Omaha evacuated. Now, for those of you who love to say that these kinds of things, as a Fukushima update doesn't matter for those in America, let me go ahead and show you where you are mistaken. These are, after all, the correct views. That is true. Uh, dated March 15th, 2019, the powerful storm system, blizzard conditions to large portions of the Black Hills in South Dakota is causing flood emergencies in Nebraska. The coax radar is being shut down until further notice for protection of lives of equipment. The National Weather Service in Omaha, Nebraska is currently evacuating and shutting down their radar due to the levee failure in Union Dyke, on and on and on, could shut down the nuclear power plant, the Spencer Hydraulic Dam. All of this could be in danger. Now, this, this kind of disaster, this kind of need to shut down, we are seeing during what is nothing more than a heavy rain spell in the United States of America. That's all it is. A lot of snow from a late winter, a rather heavy winter. If we're dealing with this kind of a problem for something as small as just a late heavy winter, what's going to happen when we're dealing with major, major problems, some kind of a real disaster where a nuclear power plant is nearby? When a, when a major disaster jeopardizes a dam near a nuclear power plant, we're looking at the America Fukushima. We've talked about it repeatedly. And these are all valuable bits of evidence, red flags, which show why the nuclear industry needs to be shut down and reined in. Plain and simple, the plants need to be shut down. And part of the issue here, and this is where Dr. Helen Caldicott and I greatly disagree, is that once the scam, the hoax of man-made global warming, is exposed, then we can quit relying on things like nuclear energy to the degree that we do. And let's face it, friends, man-made global warming is a lie. It's a hoax. It's not happening. And that brings us to the dumb of the day. Friends, you can donate to the show at the correct views of hotmail.com through PayPal. The money you give to me goes towards a better show. I'm not a more frequent Again, I am doing just uh, two a month, but uh, as you can see, I'm making them happy because that's what I do. All right, friends, Reuters, U.S. approved secret nuclear power work for Saudi Arabia. That's the dumb of the day. Now, it's a dumb of the day for two reasons. 
first of all, we know that Saudi Arabia, particularly from the ambiguity of the information that was released, there were people within the Saudi Arabian government at various levels of importance who were behind the 9-11 attacks. Now, I'm not saying that it rules out all aspects of it being an inside job. What I am saying is that there were many people who from Saudi Arabia wanted this to happen. Now, you could argue that a lot of those people are saying that they're not still with the Saudi regime. There are more moderates now. That brings me to the second reason this is a bad idea. Islam, particularly when it runs a government, has a rather nefarious habit of allowing some of the most dangerous elements of humanity to rise through their ranks. Michael Savage correctly called them Hitler and Hedzbach. Since, like all, all cultures, the culture ebbs and flows. By that I mean there have been extremely conservative times in America and extremely liberal times in America. The same thing happens in Saudi Arabia. The next time an extremely dangerous element of Islam gains any kind of foothold there, this agreement will still be in place. So even if the people that are not a danger now, really aren't. When they leave the power, who replaces them? Yeah, that's the problem we have here. So let's take a look at this. U.S. Energy Secretary Rick Perry has approved six Saudi authorizations by companies to sell nuclear power technology and assistance to Saudi Arabia according to a copy of documents seen by Reuters on Wednesday. The Trump administration has quietly pursued a wider deal on sharing U.S. nuclear power technology with Saudi Arabia, which aims to build at least two nuclear power plants. Several countries, including the United States, South Korea, and Russia, are in competition for that deal, and the winners are expected to be announced later this year by Saudi Arabia. Perry's approval is known as Part 810 authorizations allow companies to do preliminary work on nuclear power ahead of any deal, but not ship equipment that would go into the plant. Yeah, because we know they're going to listen to not share the knowledge, and of course they're perfectly trustworthy. This is a huge problem. This is one of the worst decisions I've ever seen the Trump administration stand behind. And again, I, I've said this long, long ago, Trump is wrong on just about all things nuclear. He's been a great president. He's done a lot of great things for us, and I'm probably going to vote for him again because of this. But he's wrong on these issues, and I think those of us who know that we have a responsibility to make sure that we say it to him and make sure that he knows it. Friends, that's the, the correct views. That's your massive Fukushima update. Thank you for listening, friends. Good night. And God bless.